Hello, everyone. Welcome to the stream tonight. It is hump day, and so it's time to jump into the live streams for this week and get going. So I hope you're having a good week. Um, I've had some exciting things happen this week, uh, which I may share about a little bit later. But uh, tonight I want to talk about what we're going to be getting into, which is a new project. So um, <clears throat> for those of you that have been following the live streams as of late, uh, you're probably aware that we've been talking about a dragon project that I'm currently working on. And um, uh, what I've decided to do with that project for various reasons is kind of transition that into uh, using ZBrush a little bit for the sculpting process. And so uh, I'm, I'm still not super comfortable with uh, sharing the ZBrush workflow right now because I'm still kind of learning things. Uh, but maybe I'll pop back in as the project continues and kind of share as we go. Uh, but I thought I would start a new project in Blender that uh, kind of demonstrates a little bit about how you can create an animated uh, short film. So this is going to be an ongoing series. We're going to be talking a lot about designing basic characters, how we can create controls for those, getting a Pixar-esque style look for a character, talking about some design elements in terms of how we need to create uh, emotion in the animation as well as the design. And uh, we'll be looking at some reference tonight as we get into that. So tonight it's just gonna be about the character itself, a little bit about the look development and talking about how we can go after uh, those sorts of things. So I hope you guys are strapped in and ready, got Blender open. Uh, I downloaded the latest version of 2.8 today. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch my screen over and show you guys what I'm looking at right now. Okay. Okay, so this is not 2.8, this is 2.79, uh, but this is sort of a little ball character that I've been working on. And uh, so tonight we're gonna talk about how we can do the same sort of thing, but I wanna switch over to 2.8 uh, so that we can take a look at that. So uh, what I did was I downloaded 2.8 to a folder in my downloads folder, and this is where I'm running it. So let's open this up. And we may experience some frequent um, bugs or crashes because it's still in an alpha version. So be aware, uh, I don't advise that you do a lot of work in 2.8 right now, uh, at least until uh, October, because that's when the first full release will be coming out. Uh, but let's get in here and start playing around a little bit just to have some fun. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna do is go to File, Save As. I'm gonna jump into uh, my folder for the streaming. Uh, for this project. Let's call this Pixar Ball. And I always like to start my modeling files with an underscore and then sort of a version number. And that way I can make sure I'm keeping track of uh, all of these saves and stuff like that on my hard drive. Now my chat program's not really working tonight for some reason, so I'm gonna be looking uh, over in the browser if you guys are chatting with me, but it may take me a second to uh, respond tonight because it's a little bit different than usual. Uh, but let's get in here and start playing around a little bit. So what we want to do is kind of talk about um, how we would get in here and create the ball. And I want to just focus on first sort of some basic uh, look development, which is kind of defining the style that we're going after. And so I'm going to go ahead and delete the default cube. Let's go ahead and add a UV sphere. I'm going to take my segments down to about, uh, let's say 12 and 12 for the segments and the rings uh, right there. And then let's go ahead and turn the overlay uh, wireframe on. If I can find it. There it is. A little weird. Okay. So that will turn that on for us. And now we've got our basic sphere. So uh, they're moving some of these menus around and all the stuff that was here is now over here, just so you guys are aware. Uh, and they've been kind of flipping it from top to bottom and back and forth. So you may have to dig around a little bit to find some of these options. Uh, we can play with a lot of settings. I think we're gonna end up doing this one in cycles instead of Eevee uh, because I think it'll be easier to hit that Pixar style. Uh, but we can get in here into, I think this is workbench. No, this is look dev mode. Um, this one's workbench or solid and that's rendered or Eevee depending on which 
rendering engine you have available. Now, I just opened this fresh. I don't have any of my settings saved, so we may want to jump into the edit user preferences, check under system, make sure all of our graphics cards and things are enabled, set up correctly, um, and then save the user settings. Don't currently have any of my add-ons loaded. Still have quite a few that have to be ported over. Uh, so the only one we may pay attention to a little bit later is the Node Wrangler. So I'm gonna go into the Modifiers tab over here. And you'll notice sometimes when you jump into the side view here uh, for UV sphere that it's not perfectly spherical, uh, especially when you add a uh, subsurf modifier because it tends to kind of squash it inwards and up, stretch it up a little bit. So if you just go to the add modifier and pick a cast modifier, this will let you cast towards uh, these sort of cast types. And if you choose sphere and then turn the factor up to 1.0, it will kind of squash this back down so it's perfectly round. So if we toggle this on and off, you can kind of see what that does there. Okay. Um, so we've got a question in the chat. Lauren's asking, why are you calling it a Pixar ball? Uh, so the, the Pixar reference is going to be sort of trying to get the same look that they have when they render their movies. And so we're going to talk a lot about lighting and a lot about how we build the shaders up and things to kind of mimic that style. Uh, but hopefully we'll get to that tonight if we can get in here and play a little bit more with the ball and get that set up uh, as we get started. So I'm going to talk just about basics. We'll, of course, get way more into texturing and uh, creating a lot of other stuff as we get into the series. But tonight, I just want to get as much done in this basic development as possible. So the first thing I'm going to do after I kind of squash this down, I'm going to leave all of these active so that we can play with these. And then I just want to move the ball up so that it's sitting on the ground floor because it's kind of right in the middle right now. So let's bring up our transform. And if we just move this up by one, on the Z axis, that's gonna place it right at the bottom. Now our origin is still in the middle of the ball and for right now that's okay, but we may wanna play with that a little bit later as we get going in here. So let's also kind of work on a little bit of an environment for our ball uh, and have a sort of studio uh, backdrop set up so that we can play with some of the rendering. Uh, Cause as quickly as possible, I wanna get into kind of putting a camera in here and defining some lighting and stuff like that for you guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Shift A to create a new mesh. I'm gonna choose a plane, place that at the center of our world here, and then let's jump into edit mode and start playing with this. So our edit mode is now up in the upper left-hand corner over here. So we can jump in there. And I'm gonna try to remember to save as frequently as possible because again, I have no idea what's stable and what's not. Uh, so if you are in 2.8 following along, be sure to do the same thing. Uh, but what I want to do now is kind of go ahead and build out a little studio backdrop environment. So I'm going to go ahead and scale this up in edit mode. Pick a couple of these vertices, switch to the side view here. Um, so we'll need to pick a couple of these. Uh, if, if you notice, you're trying to hit A several times to select and deselect in 2.8. Uh, a is still select all, but select deselect all is not still A, it's now Alt A, and that's how you deselect everything. So you can still find that in the uh, select menu now that to select none is Alt A, and so it's not the same keyboard shortcut, uh, which could be a little confusing if you're just getting started with 2.8, and I had to kind of figure that out for myself. So what I'm doing now is just extruding some faces up on the side, and I wanna build a really gradual transition on the very back of this backdrop so that there's a almost a shadowless transition straight up to a vertical wall. And so this is um, commonly used in the photography and film industries to create um, a sort of seamless backdrop. And these are psych walls for cyclorama. Okay, so you'll also notice that you can't really switch into uh, wireframe mode, uh, but if you hit Z on and off, you'll also notice that this button is changing and it's this is the limit selection to visible clipped with depth, bu depth buffer. Uh, and that'll control whether or not, I think you can select through an object. Yeah, so if that is uh, disabled, you will be able to do the same thing you used to do in wireframe mode, which is to select all the way through a mesh. 
um, just like that. Uh, so let's pull this down. Down. Again, it's going to take me a while to uh, remember the new keyboard shortcuts, as I'm sure it will for everybody, but I'm sure that we will adapt. Okay. So once we have our little psych wall built and it is a smooth curve from the ground, sort of like a half pipe shape all the way up, uh, let's go ahead and smooth this out. Uh, so we're gonna go to Object, Shade, Smooth. And that's the button that used to be over here in the Tools palette, but now it is uh, here. And uh, so now that we have that sort of built, let's go ahead and add a camera. So I'm gonna go Shift A, add a camera. And what I want to do is kind of jump into a front view here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit, and then I'm going to use Control Alt. Or first, I'm going to hit Control Zero to make sure that uh, we're looking through that active camera there. And then from this front view, I just want to use Control Alt Zero on the numpad to kind of position our camera from that same perspective. OK, so let's move this up, point this down a little bit and then pull out. Okay, so I'm gonna make the studio a little bit wider so that we're not seeing the edges of our backdrop there. And if we want, we can start adding some materials here. I'm just gonna use a basic, we'll just call this clay for now. And I'm gonna go ahead and assign that to all of the materials as we are, or all the objects as we're creating this. And now the last thing we need is some lighting. So let's go ahead and hit Shift A, jump into the light section here, and let's grab an area light. Jump into the side view, kind of reposition this. You'll notice you have a new um, little handle here on the lights that allow you to left click and drag and kind of point these in a direction. So it's kind of nice. You can also scale the lights up to increase the size of the light. So under the light properties here, we can uh, change the same sort of things we used to change. Uh, size here will actually adjust the uh, size of the light for the shadows. So we might make this a 2.0, so it's a big soft shadow light. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and point this off to the side. And let's go ahead and create another view here. And let's put a 3D view and let's look through our camera here. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use um, rendered only so that we're not seeing anything in this, uh, we're not seeing any overlays. And so used to, you'd have to dig through this and select you know rendered only from the view or something like that in the properties tab. Now you can just uncheck the gizmos and outlines button here so there's no overlays at all in your 3D viewport. So you're just gonna be seeing uh, what is gonna be in the camera view. So uh, control spacebar will uh, maximize or minimize a um, viewport here. So we'll do that. And then we forgot to shade our sphere here. So let's go to object, shade smooth. Now you'll see that those facets are gone on the sphere in our viewport here. Let's go ahead and set a rendered border here, which did not work with the normal keyboard shortcut. So let's see if we can track down the border checkbox right there. So that'll set that to the entire camera width. And then let's try to get this camera full screen in this little box down here. Okay. So now what I can do is hit Shift Z and this will show me a little preview as I'm working in the bottom right hand corner. The smaller this window is, the easier it's gonna be for Blender to calculate things quickly. And so that's kind of the reason um, I shoved a, a little camera preview down the bottom right hand corner. Um, so I'm realizing that my camera is covering that up. So what I'm probably gonna do is switch this to the top view here. And let's try it up here instead. Okay, so let's get rid of that, and there we go. So now you can look in this upper right-hand corner and you should be able to see uh, the rendered preview there. All right, so even with one light here, you see it's pretty big, pretty soft, and we've got a nice looking little clay render going on. 
And if we want to get some more interesting lighting, what we'll need to do is kind of duplicate some of these area lights around. So I'm going to hit Shift D to duplicate. Let's move this over here. And then rotate this. So for area lights uh, in a studio environment like this, you want to kind of differentiate the properties. Uh, so that's kind of in every single area. So instead of making this one square in shape, let's make this one sort of a, let's try a disc. We haven't really had this available to us before, but now that's a new thing in 2.8. Uh, so we can lower the size of this, maybe change the intensity uh, to be a little brighter. And I'm gonna go ahead and save again. So one thing I wanna do is turn on the filmic um, options here. So I'm gonna jump over into my scene settings under color management. So filmic is default now, uh, which is good because that's what we want. So typically the whole time if we're gonna do more realistic lighting is to use filmic. So I'm gonna move this into place. And what we wanna do basically for some more cinematic lighting, and I'm gonna do a whole stream on this, so I'm not gonna to get tons into this right now, but we want to add a lot of uh, variation and contrast with the lighting from these directions. And so in film terms, they would say you have ratios. So uh, this could be a four to one ratio, which means from the darkest area in the image to the brightest area in the image, there's a four to one contrast difference or, or two to one or six to one, it just depends, eight to one, it just depends on what it is. Uh, and so the more contrast and depth we can add to an image in terms of uh, not only light and dark, but in terms of color and things like that, uh, the more we're gonna get that cinematic feel. So we need to start with lighting by keeping that in mind and kind of positioning these in place. So I'm gonna do the same thing and we're gonna create a basic three point lighting set up here. So let's go ahead and move this one into place on this side. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and I'm gonna constantly kind of tweak these as we go just to make sure we're, we're getting a good feel here. So this one's gonna be a very high up light. This one on the side is gonna be sort of maybe a little above the height of the sphere here. We're gonna aim this one back down towards it. And then this one I want to be sort of behind and this would be a rim light or a hair light sometimes it's called. So the brightest one in the scene is gonna be the key, which is right here. So if we go to the light properties, you'll see this one is at, let's call it 300. This one right here, the area light is set at 100 and it's got a softer fill for the shadows uh, because it's a bigger light. And then the backlight is usually, um, it depends on your, your lighting setup, but typically the, the backlight can be the most intense light. And so if you're gonna be doing this one, maybe we choose a, uh, let's say an ellipse or maybe even a rectangle. And with the rectangle, you can change the size and the X and Y to be different from each other. So this one we can make a little wider than tall uh, or even a little taller than wide, depending on what your studio is set up like. And from here, we can make this one really bright. So let's make this one something like a thousand uh, or maybe even 3000. And you can see it just highlights the edge of our object and adds some more separation from the foreground to the background. Uh, so we're getting quite a lot of shadowing there, which is kind of interesting. I'm gonna rotate the background a little bit so that it's not catching uh, any edges of this light. And then we might rotate this a little bit, pull this up, point this down. Something like that. Okay, so the little dot you're seeing here is this actual, uh, this little black dot. And so I'm not sure why that's showing up uh, there, but uh, that won't be rendered. Okay, so that is kind of a basic three point lighting setup. <coughs> and um, again, we wanna play with the, the ratio here a little bit to kind of define what this needs to look like. So as we get in here and mess with this, we'll, we'll experiment around until we are happy with the way this is looking. And then we'll kind of leave things locked off a bit so that it's not gonna be um, sort of touched. So if we lower the fill light even more, we're gonna get more of a shadow here, which is gonna, again, add to the contrast 
uh, in terms of the lighting setup. We could do the same thing for the key light, bring this down to like a 150. And so then we're getting more of a backlit situation. So we're not totally eliminating the light from the front, but we're, we're definitely uh, getting a backlit type of thing going on here. And that's very stylistic and cool. But I think what we may want to do here first is go ahead and try to um, get a pretty even lighting so that we can show off the, um, the materials. So let's go ahead and change this to a rectangular. And then I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna widen this up a bit. So this wraps around the sphere a little more. And then let's turn this up to maybe 200. And the further you get away from the ball in terms of distance, uh, from the center of the light to the center of the ball, the um, inverse square law comes into effect, which is basically how sharp the fall off of the light is. So if it's right up next to the ball, you're gonna get really intense values with you know, the strength at 150. But the more you back off, the more exponentially this value, even though it's the same, will fall off uh, from having any effect on the scene. And so that's just a, a way that light behaves in the physical world. Um, and so you kind of have to keep that in mind. The further you back away a light, the more you're gonna have to add. And it seems really obvious, but there actually is some math involved in terms of, you know, you may have to add twice as much as before or four times as much if you're, you know, four times as far away. So uh, just keep that in mind. And right now I'm just gonna kind of play with these sliders a little bit until I see something that piques my interest. Okay, so I don't want to eliminate the core shadow altogether. I still want to have something there, but I like this really kind of flat look just for getting our materials defined and in place. And then we can go back in and do a lot more interesting uh, stylistic lighting. But for a basic studio setup, this will kind of help us determine uh, what needs to be in place as we are getting in here to uh, define our, our projects from the beginning. So let's go ahead and change our uh, rotation from the median point to the three cursor, which is going to be in the center of the world. So the three cursor snap to center of the world is not the, what it should be. Uh, let's see if we can find the right command. So I'm going to hit spacebar, go to search for command. And that's what I'm looking for. Snap cursor to center. It used to be shift C and now it's not assigned. So we need to do that. So you put that in our uh, center of our 3D world here. And now when we rotate, the lights are gonna rotate around that 3D cursor. So I wanna actually position this one up a little bit higher, just like that. And I might even make this one a little bigger. And let's play a little bit with the coloring here. So with the fill lights, maybe what I wanna do is kind of shift this more towards the blue. So I'm gonna add a very slight uh, blue shift and you can see just how little I moved that dot and how it's kind of affecting the blue color here. And then I'm gonna go a little bit more towards red for the key light. So I'm gonna go a very slight shift towards the warm and you're gonna see a little bit of difference there. Uh, now, we can also drop the intensity down uh, so that we get a bit more of a saturated uh, look for the shadows, uh, which can be helpful, but it all just depends on the style you're going for. So I'm not gonna get too stylized now because again, we're, we're just testing this out, but it's important to kind of take your time with this step and define uh, a sort of basic lighting setup that gets you um, something interesting to look at for your tests. Okay. Lights are typically not perfectly balanced in the center. You're gonna have warm or cool lights, depending on what you're shooting with. Outside lights are gonna be, tend to be bluer. Um, and then uh, indoor lights are gonna tend to be a little bit more red in nature. So we may want to make some of these sort of split down the middle. Uh, possibly go a little bit towards the green side. But I think for now, that's gonna be good. Okay. So let's get back to uh, sort of testing how this looks. And I think I'm gonna do a separate material for the floor. So I'm gonna rename this one floor. 
And so far we haven't gotten to the node editor yet. Uh, and let's just take the base color down so that we get a little bit more visual separation from the sphere here. Okay, so that's a good basic setup for our ball here. So we haven't really got into defining, you know, how realistic this is gonna look. We haven't got into defining uh, how we're gonna make this into a character because a ball is a pretty boring thing. So you might think from the, the get go. Uh, but the point is with that creative limitation in place, how can we kind of make this interesting and give it some expression and things like that. Now, a lot of that can be done with just animating the movements in a certain way, um, but you can also do that with the texturing. And so tonight, let's take a look at some inspiration and see if we can figure out what we wanna do. So what I've been looking at possibly for this design is maybe like a beach ball and uh, or maybe a bouncy ball. And so what I've kind of been wanting to do is figure out, okay, well, what are the basic material characteristics of a beach ball? We know we have these sort of striped lines that emanate out from the center and it's sort of like a pinwheel shape. And then sort of on the poles, we have these solid colors. And so we're trying to find what the, uh, you know, sort of characteristics that everybody associates with a beach ball would be. And that way, no matter who's looking at this, they're immediately gonna recognize this as a beach ball. So they're really shiny, sort of plasticky. Um, and then, you know, you're gonna have these striped colors that are big and bold uh, there. So that right there gives us a lot to work with when it comes to doing expressions because we've got uh, a lot to deal with just with the colors. So we could do solid colors, we could do mixed colors, we could do, um, in terms of expressions for the ball, I've been thinking we could do um, different widths and have those animate. So all of that is stuff that gives us more to use in our tool bag as we get in here and try to create some expressions. So basic beach ball is there. Now let's look up some Pixar style. Um, maybe Pixar frames will actually give us some frame grabs from these movies. And so we're looking for basic stuff that you would see in a Pixar movie. Uh, in terms of the lighting that we can grab that will give us something to go off of for the style that we're going after here. Uh, and so let's go ahead and start. I've got a new board started uh, and this is gonna be here for uh, all the stuff in this project. So this will be public so you guys can go into my Pinterest and check this out if you want. Um, but I'm trying to get actual frame grabs from the movies so that we've got some stuff to look at. So let's go back to Pixar movies and play a little bit more. So this is a good one. In terms of that lighting, you can see how very contrasted uh, this is and cinematic this is. And so we need to kind of start associating, you know, certain common elements between each of these movies uh, with how this looks. So you'll notice the characters often get simplified um, and they still look great, but they're, they're simplified more than the backgrounds. The backgrounds are almost very, uh, realistic and rendered out, and that's a common thing that you'll see throughout most of the Pixar movies. So any of the set design or prop designs are gonna be very realistic looking. Um, so here's another one we can grab, and it really doesn't matter what it is as long as it's some good rendering uh, that can demonstrate for us what we need to be looking at. Uh, so again, for Wally, you'll notice like the entire uh, background segment, all of those details are very I mean, if you were to take the Pixar characters out of this environment and to just post this environment up, it would look pretty realistic. Um, and so again, that's gonna be a pretty common element that we see here. And if you've done any of my projects with me in the past, you know this is kind of the, the research phase I like to do at the beginning of each of my projects to get myself in a place where um, I'm, I'm kind of grasping what's coming next. Um, and I think that is a great thing to do when you are working on any project, no matter what it is. Okay. So it's another Pixar short. And if we're not getting what we're looking for, mixing up the terms is often something that's good that kind of points you in the right direction. Um, that's a good one for some lighting here. 
up as a good reference and might give us the most bang for our buck in terms of lighting. So close-ups on the characters are going to be good for, you know, really breaking down the shading and the lighting that they set up. And um, let's see if we can get some more stuff from that. And I'm just going to grab a few more and then we'll, we'll get back to what we were doing. Uh, but I want to make sure. Let's try Toy Story. All right, so for right now, I'm going to switch over to Google. And let's look at images and since we're not going to be um, you know reusing any of this stuff it's not really going to matter but I'm going to try to find some large ones and I'm looking specifically again for frame grabs right out of the movie because um, I think these are going to do a lot better job kind of just, just demonstrating to us what we need to be going after here so we get one of these you can get, have the Pinterest uh, sort of plug in saved. I've got this saved in Chrome. So now I can just go ahead and still save this to my board here. And get rid of that. So anybody else have any Pixar movies that you want me to kind of look at and we can grab this reference. Let me know in the chat. And uh, I'm kind of blanking on ideas right now. So bear in mind, Toy Story came out in 1995, I think. And uh, <laughs> even if you look at this frame today, it holds up really, really well uh, in terms of 3D animation. So again, what we're going for is something kind of like this in terms of simplicity, but this this looks like you know realistic plastic. So it, it's got a little bit of a weird mixture of um, you know real world materials and lighting, but they push the boundaries as far as what we can animate uh, on, on the toys themselves. Uh, so let's jump back into Pinterest here. Jump into our boards. And let's look at our Pixar board. Okay. So looking at these, and sometimes you have to open these in a new tab to get the full image, um, but they're, there's a lot going on, and, and what you're going to notice typically with the Pixar style is that you're going to have a lot of colors in, in every movie, and that, again, harkens back to kind of Disney itself uh, before Pixar. But So we're going to want to focus on how to get some more saturation and some fun colors in with this, uh, but in a way that seems a little bit more realistic and smart. So it is very stylized in some areas, so you can see down here on the buildings, we don't have tons of things going on, but there's just enough there to hint at, you know, maybe this is sort of a beyond a cartoon world. Uh, and the same thing goes with the, the hero props like this house and stuff and the balloons that looks very photorealistic. Um, but at the same time, they've got something kind of, you know, extra, very chromatic about it, uh, extra saturated, poppy. And you'll also notice that we've got a lot of very, uh, strong color correction going on here that pushes the 
uh, you know, sort of filmic aspect of this in a certain direction. So some of this is going to come down to compositing, but I want to get as much of that in the actual material creation as possible as we get in here. Uh, so again, you'll, you're going to notice that in some of these areas, some of the leaves, you know, up here kind of look realistic. You get down in here, it looks a little bit less realistic. So they do take shortcuts, but only where they really need to. The fur is usually really pretty good. Feathers, again, you know, kind of in terms of on a slider from cartoony to realistic, you've got it kind of 60%, 70% of the way there. Um, so the skin is going to be always a little bit more pastel and soft and powdery to the touch. And so uh, that's kind of interesting and unique. And so the props are also going to be a little bit more like things that you would find that are um, maybe plastic or uh, clay like in terms of the way that you might do this if it were stop motion. And so all of those things are things that we can then take now back into Blender and go, all right, how do we look at this and then determine how to add that back in our scene? So I'm going to be looking at backgrounds, making sure that those come across as uh, sort of realistic. And then our main character, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty and kind of stylize it a little bit. So let's jump back into Blender now. So this is a little test I did on a beach ball this afternoon. And uh, right now I'm going to go ahead and try to duplicate this in 2.8 and show you how I added these stripes here. So let's jump back over to 2.8. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna turn off the wireframes. Still got our rendering engine going over here. Let's go ahead and split this down so we can get a node editor up. And now it's called the shader editor. So uh, you'll see that is a difference. So I want this one to be a 3D view. I want this one to be a shader editor. Okay. You'll also notice that typically when you have EV enabled from the beginning as your rendering engine, you're always going to get a principal BSDF um, attached. Uh, and so that is kind of the default that's attached from here on in. And if you want to stick with a PBR kind of workflow, then I would recommend sticking with this. Uh, and for now, we can kind of just play with what we have here instead of kind of trying to create something custom. So for the base color, maybe uh, and actually we're tweaking the ground right now. I want to be tweaking the ball. For the base color, let's brighten this up a little bit back to kind of a white. And I want the roughness to come down so that it's more uh, sort of plasticky in nature. So maybe a 0.15. So you can kind of see the highlight from our lamp uh, off in the distance over here. We've also got a clear coat option on the principled um, BSDF that is going to add another shiny reflective uh, layer on top of our base layer uh, automatically. And then you've got a separate roughness value here for that. Now, this is going to default to a 0.03, which is a pretty mirror like finish. Um, but that's, again, something that you can look at here. You've also got sheen, which will give you some interesting effects. Sliding this around, you can kind of see some fringing on the edges and things like that. So that's kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of things we can play with in here. And of course, once we start messing with normals and actually plugging PBR um, maps into these channels, we can really start to affect the material in an interesting way. So uh, let's talk about, again, how we need to start getting in here and playing with uh, the, the animation. So we talked about the fact that we have the ability to animate this. We can squash and stretch the ball. Uh, we can control you know, how, how it's rolling across the ground. That's another aspect of animation. Obviously, the speed that it's moving, uh, whether it bounces or kind of rolls slowly and creeps up on something. Uh, but we also have the texture to play with. Now, the interesting thing about the texture is the positioning, the color, all of that sort of stuff. And so let's just play a little bit with some options here and see what we could do to create some fun changes in the texture. So I'm going to sort of minimize the principal BSDF here. I'm going to go ahead and add in another shader. And let's use a diffuse on top of this. And I'm going to go ahead and add a mix shader as well. Add that in and put this on top. So uh, what I want to do now is sort of start defining uh, for myself, what 
the uh, factor needs to be to kind of mix these together. So for this, I actually want to use a different color. Let's try something really uh, striking like this red here. And then for the factor, we have several options in terms of how to mix this. Now we want to be thinking about controls and what we need to do to start actually getting the stripes on the ball. But then we also want to be able to kind of squash and stretch the width of those, maybe change the rotation, the position, and, and all that sort of stuff. So we can do that a little bit in the material properties or where there's some other ways we can do that as well. So let's explore first in the material properties. Let's just go to the shader here. And I'm actually gonna rename the clay material to ball. Okay, so in terms of our texture, we're gonna need a texture coordinate and probably a mapping coordinate. I don't think I have the Node Wrangler turned on. I'm not sure if that's available yet, but let's search it under add-ons, Node Wrangler. Okay, it is turned on. So uh, this should speed things up a little bit in terms of previewing. So we've got that. Doesn't look like it's really working right now, um, but supposedly it is installed and is there. So we may have to change uh, check out some of those uh, keyboard shortcuts and how those might have been switched around. But for now, I'll just kind of do everything manually so you guys can see it. Uh, under mapping. And now what we want to do is go ahead and grab the object coordinate, plug that in the vector, and then under vector, we'll have that under normal. And actually, I want to do this on a texture. So let's grab a texture maybe a brick texture and um, plug this in right here. We'll go ahead and plug the factor up to this and that will kind of preview in our little render here uh, what the brick texture is doing. So if we're looking at our object coordinates with the mapping node here, we can actually scale and change some of the way this looks there. You can also change the rotation of our lines and things there, but we're gonna have to play a little bit with the um, settings for our brick texture first. So let's bring the frequency down, play with the offset a little bit. Okay, so for the scale, let's go pretty, pretty low. And I actually want to uh, play with the um, the colors here, so that we're only getting lines going in one direction. So let's see if we can do that. Um, bring that down. I'm just dragging stuff around right now until I find something that may work for us. Maybe if we take one of these colors down just to black, it won't show up. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so that will rotate those for us there. All right, so we're getting the lines on the the ball, but they're not kind of rotating around the poles that we that we want. Uh, so let's play with some of these other settings and see if we can change the behavior there. And what we may want to do is we could even assign an object like an empty, and help that will help us uh, kind of place the texture in a more um, direct way. So I'm gonna make the size bigger here so we can actually see this in our 3D viewport. And then let's grab the empty object from our little uh, texture coordinate. At the bottom, you can see object here. Hover over the empty that we created. 
pick that, and now the empty will help us kind of position that texture. So if I move that around now, you can see that it's having an effect on our texture there. And that's actually being fed into the mapping uh, coordinates for our object so that we can play with that. So you'll see scale affects the scale. Any of the rotations on any of the axes actually have an effect. And so it's very kind of interesting. OK, so I don't know if brick texture is actually going to do what we want it to do. Uh, let's swap this out with another uh, texture here. And let's see, what else could we do? We could do a gradient texture and try that. To actually see this, we'd want to plug that in there. And you see it's going to be mapped again to the object based on uh, all of our settings over here. So as we move this around, you're going to change that. And what we would want to do is actually intercept this with a color ramp and then kind of define how this looks here. So let's bring this all the way up to, there it is, to white. We might use a constant fall off so we can get some stripes. And then we can go ahead and add in some more here. Let's go ahead and see if this is gonna kind of do what we want it to do. You can see I'm just creating some stripes like this. So okay, we switched to normal here, that might actually help us out. Okay, so let's move, let's move the empty up into the middle of the ball here. And I'm just playing with the rotation a little bit now to see what we got going on here. I'm gonna disable the rotation around the, um, the cursor. So let's move this back to uh, medium point. Okay, so there is a way probably to get this to pinch around the poles as we get in here. Uh, we might have to play a little bit more with the way that we're going about mapping this. Maybe instead of object, we could use a normal, and let's cycle through these and see what happens. Generated might do it. Um, So sometimes just cycling through those can help. Uh, but I think there is uh, a lot of other ways to do this as well. So one of the other things we could do is play with a different factor element to kind of drive this. So let's go ahead and get rid of these here. And instead for the factor, let's use a um, inputs and then we're gonna use a uh texture coordinate no uh inputs what am i looking for vertex color that's what i'm looking for attribute that's how we do it okay so I'll explain what I'm doing in a second here. Let's go ahead and add a vertex color. And then let's jump into edit mode. And what I'm gonna do is switch this over <laughs> uh, to, okay, keyboard shortcuts have messed me up, sorry guys. Switching this over to edge mode or face mode. Let's disable that for now. Okay, so what I wanna do is grab all of these areas that I want to be this other color. And once I have these faces sort of in place, 
I can go ahead and jump into vertex color or vertex paints and I'm gonna draw and let's play with our settings which are up here which is kind of interesting go to strength to one Let's do mix instead of draw. Let's drag this all the way down to black. Okay. Let's see if there's a way to get the selection to follow us in. Okay. I'm not sure if that's going to do it for us. Anyways, let's see if I can get the basic principle in place for you guys and uh, kind of show you what I'm trying to do. So let's go into vertex paints. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm gonna set this to a mix brush, make sure the strength is all the way up to one, uh, change the color so that it's not painting on white on white. And then when I paint this, uh, it's gonna assign specific values to the vertices. And then we can actually use that map that's being created in the vertex color section down here uh, in our texture up here. So we'll have to figure out a better way to get in here and clean this up a little bit, but this will kind of demonstrate what I'm trying to do. Okay. So Let's start this back up, and there you go. So anything that was painted with the vertex color, uh, this is labeled COL, and then uh, you add an attribute node, and under factor, you pull that into the factor of the mix shader, and then make sure you use the name COL, which will refer to the vertex color channel that you have down here. And you can see that whatever we painted, black um, will show up here, or actually it's inverted. So whatever we did not paint black uh, will show up with um, the original principle color here. And then whatever we, we left white will show up with the diffuse here. So there we go. One of the other options is we could also uh, just create two separate materials uh, in terms of getting the look in place. So for that, what we just need to do is, this would be all of the white areas of our ball here. Label this ball uh, white. And then once again, jump into um, edit mode. Make sure you have all the faces selected that you want to be sort of uh, created with this um, striped color here. And then we would create a new material. And instead of just making one up here, uh, what I would do is pick the ball white and then um, create this, uh, hit this plus sign here to create a new material. We would name this ball red. And then under the principal shader, we could go ahead and change the base color to something like this. And then hit assign and everything that is part of that new material will then show up here as red so that's a more direct way to do it and the only issue with doing this for our um our final version of the rigged ball would be um trying to figure out how to control the mapping here because we've basically just selected individual polygons uh to do this and so that's going to be an issue when we're trying to animate this because the only way to actually control the red stripes in terms of the width and you know the positioning and all that sort of stuff would be to um actually move the geometry around so anytime we are playing with sort of an edge here and let's switch back to edge mode 
So if I start moving this around, you can see in the 3D viewport in the upper right hand corner that this is workable as a solution, but as in terms of rigging this, it would be kind of hard to set this up in a way that would be fast and easy to manipulate um, in terms of not slowing down. And we've also got a subsurf on here. Uh, so trying to animate, just manipulating these vertices, the ball wouldn't stay around, there'd be a lot of issues. So we need to find a better way to do this. Um, uh, the, the best way to do it would actually be to implement it into the material, but I think we're gonna have to spend some more time thinking through how we wanna try that out, the rig. Uh, and for tonight, I just wanted to kind of get into the look development and giving you some ideas about what you may come up against as you try to work on this on your own. So just keep that in mind. So you have to kind of think these things through as you're getting in here and developing them out. What may work at a stage like this where it's, it's trying to nail the textures and all of that may not work if you're trying to get to a point where you can animate those attributes down the road. Uh, so just remember that. And um, <clears throat> let's see. So the other option would be to UV map this and then we can play with the UVs positioning and uh, still use the mapping node and all of that, and maybe you can figure that there. But still, you're not going to get individual control over all of those, those edges. So let me kind of show you what I did this afternoon to kind of solve this problem and how it may actually end up being our solution for this ball. So I'm going to go ahead and isolate the ball off on a separate layer, so we're not having to deal with all this other stuff. And the way that works in uh, 2.8 is by using collections. So if we go to the uh, outliner here, let's see if we can find it, there we go. Uh, instead of layers, you can, you'll can you notice even in object mode, you're not gonna see layers anywhere in your 3D viewport, and that's because they're gone. Uh, now they're using something called collections. So if you look under your outliner here, you'll see scene collection, and then under this, you'll see collection one, and then you'll see things like objects, and under objects, we've got sphere here, and you know again, you can see all the modifiers that are attached to it, and stuff like that. Uh, but what we want to do is go ahead and create a separate piece here uh, for the ball so that we're turning all the rest of the stuff off. So in this case, if we look at the objects and when you check off the visibility here, the sphere is the only thing under the objects uh, it's collection right here. And so if you want to add more, you can like select the background and um, go to objects and collection and you can create a new collection from uh, this object remove it from an existing collection um, and then you can add this to the active collection so we add this to the active collection so i missed the option there let's go back um, it's going to ask you what the uh, active collection is basically in the scene so Let's go ahead and jump into uh, this right here and let's just create a new one. So create a new collection. It's going to ask you what name. Let's call all of this stuff background. And there we go. And you should see that pop up. So um, let's see here where this is. And there we go. Okay, so under collections, you'll see background now, and you can see that. So uh, let's just say the lighting, we would wanna add that to the background, and we'd wanna add these. Maybe the camera. Okay, so now what you can do with these is kind of play with the uh, visibility. So it looks like we've got some, some scene level collections and then we've got some object level collections. And I'm gonna have to play a little bit more with uh, how these work and are showing up because I was expecting to see them in here, um, but I'm not seeing that. So let's look in here. making sure I look at all of these options and kind of see what we have to play with here. Oop. 
You'll also see that under collections down here, you can add instances of the collection. And uh, that's handy for duplicating objects around. Okay, so for now, let's just hide this stuff. Unless we can go into local view. Not seeing local view. Let's search for it. Yeah, I don't see local view, which is what I would normally use, but let's uh, invert the selection, hide everything, and now we can just play with this. Okay. Um, all right, so what I did was I created a separate object. So let's go to mesh plane. And then from the side view, we'll rotate this. And that looks like negative 90 degrees. I'm gonna go ahead and apply the rotation, jump into edit mode instead. And then let's go ahead and scale this up. So I'm gonna turn off the rendering because it's kind of slowing things down for now. And let's work on kind of scaling this up a little bit. And we want to basically right now what we're trying to do is create these stripes. So um, we are going to scale this up enough to wrap around the ball here. So maybe not that much, maybe about like that. And then I want to add some loop cuts. So I'm going to hit Control R and then roll up on my mouse wheel to kind of add several of these in here. And then I want to jump into uh, face mode. And let's go ahead and grab every other um, sort of stripe here. Grab these center ones and delete the faces. OK, so we got some basic stripes that we can play with. Now I'm going to move these further out from the ball so that they're a little bit further away. And I want to go ahead and assign that red material to these. So one of the other things we can do here is grab the base color, control C, jump into the uh, viewport display and then paste that into the diffuse color. And that will kind of show off uh, what that looks like in our viewport. Uh, for now, let's also go ahead and get rid of the um, material under the ball for the red material. So under ball red, let's just hit uh, minus to remove that. And instead, we're going to try to wrap these stripes around the ball. So let's move this up a little bit so we can see our modifiers. And let's go ahead and add a modifier. And let's add a subdivision surface. I'm going to turn this up quite a bit because we need more geometry to wrap around the ball. And then what I need to do is actually create some more subdivisions so that these can um, stay straight up and down. So instead of adding loop cuts in all of these, what I'm going to do is use the knife tool. So if I hit K and then Z, I can actually draw a line straight through all of these. And if you hold, if you hit C, that will constrain that on the uh, horizontal axis. Left click to accept. Enter to confirm the final of that. And then I would do the same thing across again. So hit K, hit Z to do an entire uh, horizontal cut all the way across. Hit C to constrain on the horizontal axis. Left click to confirm, enter to accept, and there we go. So now we can, uh, again, jump into edge mode. I'm going to hit Shift and select all of these edges. And then I want to scale a little bit on the Z axis so that these are positioned towards the outside edges, uh, which will keep these sort of straight up and down. So now you can see even in object mode with the subsurface applied, uh, we're keeping these tips a little bit straighter. And that will help a little bit as we get in here. So we've also got a lot of geometry to work with because we're using a subsurface of six. And now we can go ahead and add a um, simple deform. So let's go ahead and grab that. We're going to want to bend this. And we're going to bend this about 180 degrees. I'm going to go ahead and add a empty with the plane axis here. 
I always like to make the size a little bit better. Now I'm not scaling this, I'm actually increasing the size parameter under the empty uh, menu, and that is going to actually increase the visual size of this on our canvas, but you'll see the scale is still set to one, which is important because um, we don't wanna actually scale the empty. It may have an effect on these other objects. So going back to our sphere here, uh, we grab our stripes and then under the axis origin, I'm gonna eyedropper the empty we just created. This needs to be at the center of our ball here. So if I hit G, Z, and then type in one, that's gonna put it right in the middle of our, our ball. And now you'll notice that we are kind of wrapping these sort of lines horizontally around the ball here. So if they're too big, you can kind of scale them down. What I would do is make sure that you have all of your preview settings turned on so you can kind of see what this is looking like. Uh, it doesn't look like it's actually showing us in edit mode, which it should be. Um, but if you scale those down, they'll uh, come back in towards the ball a little bit more. Now we need to work on kind of wrapping these around and we'll keep tweaking these values as well. So we'll hit uh, copy to make another copy of this. But now we want to deform this around the ball uh, horizontally. So I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this empty. Hit escape to leave it where it is in the middle. And I'm going to call this one uh, horizontal wrap. And then let's change the empty um, to a circle so that we can have an easier time selecting these two, like this. Okay, we'll get rid of that, make sure we have the right empty selected. And then for this empty, what we're gonna wanna have to do is play with the rotation a little bit. So what I like to do is just kind of start rotating in some of these axes and trying to figure out which direction we need to go to make this work. Um, so it looks like 90 degrees on the Y axis will do it, uh, but we're not actually on the right empty. So let's get rid of that. Select this one and then Okay, so we need to go negative 90 on the y-axis, and there we go. We've got this wrapped all the way around. So the problem we still have at this point is that it's in the right shape, but it's not on the ball. Uh, so let's go ahead and add another modifier, and this time instead of deform, we're gonna use a uh, shrink wrap. So let's grab shrink wrap. Target is gonna be the sphere and you'll see that just kind of grabs and sucks it down onto the surface of the sphere. So we're gonna to wanna to check off keep above surface and then I wanna increase this a little bit to where it's sitting on the top and a little bit above and outside. And we might also change this to project and negative. So. Before we play with that stuff, let's make sure we have everything kind of set up for success here. Scale these down a little bit more. And let's play a little bit with these deform settings. Okay, so we may have to move the empties around a little bit, not really sure yet, but before we try anything, I like to play with the angles because sometimes these can be a little off. So might do a 360 degree wrap on that. So it doesn't look like scaling is gonna do it for us on these. May have to do a smaller angle wrap to get those in place. Could be shrink wrap settings. Okay. So if you're getting some weird things happening, let's go ahead and turn off all of the previews for our shrink wrap. 
So that's the last thing that we have in place. And you'll see before we get to that, we've already got some issues happening here. So I wanna play with this a little bit until we get this resolved. So one of the things we're gonna to wanna to do is kind of position things in place so that it's right down the center of the ball. So I'm gonna move this empty for the horizontal wrap on the Y axis until we're right down the center of our sphere here. Try to line up these sides as well. And let's take one more step back and preview how the wrap is working on this. So I may pull Pull this back a little bit as well. Okay, now let's step back through our modifiers, turn them on one by one and see how that's working. Okay, so it looks like our wrap is a little better now. We're gonna have to play with the distance around so that we can get a better uh, skip there. So instead of going 360, we're gonna have to back this off and we can get precise on this later, but right now I just kinda wanna eyeball that skip distance, and then let's turn back on our shrink wrap. Okay, so we're pretty close. We need to work on our accuracy a little bit, but for the most part, that is in place. Okay, so let's pull down our offset a tiny bit so it's still a little bit more on the surface. Might choose a 0 0.005, so it's just on the surface there and imperceivable to the eye from a distance. Okay. So what we can do now is unhide all of our stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and save again. So now you can see our ball is kind of back in place the way it should be. And all we've really done is take the same setup here and um, switch out the principal BSDF. So if we look at the ball red here, you can see how that looks. And under ball whites, you have the same basic principle there. Okay, so it looks good from here. And then we would need to kind of look at how this actually helps us out uh, in terms of the animation. So the reason I'm doing it this way now is because if we actually look at the stripes in edit mode, we've still got these um, straight up and down without the modifiers. Now, the reason that is important is because if we actually change the um, the pivot point here to the individual origins for our faces, what we can do is then scale these along the x-axis and it will actually affect the way these are showing up on our ball um, in the render. So what I'm going to do is, uh, let's see if we can get this actually previewing correctly. Yeah, so it doesn't look like it's actually showing us what it should be showing us because all of these turned on, it should actually be wrapping around the sphere uh, in edit mode too, um, but that's not working. So what I'm gonna do is kind of give you an example of what this will do. Uh, at this distance, if we scale these uh, out to about this width here and then go back into object mode, you can see we have very wide stripes. And then if we jump back into edit mode, and scale these down to where they're very skinny. We're gonna jump back into object mode, we're gonna have very skinny stripes. And so by just editing the width of our individual planes here, we're gonna be able to give a lot of expression and dynamic uh, sort of feel to the ball. Uh, and we could do things like make it blink uh, or try to try to pretend maybe that we have some eyes uh, on the ball here and by using the width we can determine what mood it's in by changing the color we can determine what mood the ball's in uh, and stuff like that so that is an interesting thing you can actually see this demonstrated a little bit better in 2.79 so if i jump back over here and show you on this ball you can kind of see what what this does so this is what's happening real time in 2.8 so you just can't see it because the alpha uh, version right now is not really cooperating. So, 
Yeah. And so we can actually set up some parameters when we are rigging this to manually scale these uh, all together or even one by one. And so if we just scale one of these, we're going to have individual control over these sections. And so you can imagine um, the interesting things we could do just with multiple lines um, kind of all together. If we scale, we can make this a solid color uh, all the way through, or we can make really, really individual lines if it's kind of scared. You know, you can imagine this going from a really bold color when it's angry to this when it's frightened and running away or something like that. And so that can be kind of a fun little playful thing to do there. Uh, but yeah, so let's work a little bit more with the rest of our time tonight on getting the look development in place for our ball. So I'm not going to talk anymore about the animation tonight. Let's just talk about how to get this looking um, like a, a real ball. Uh, so I'm going to play a little bit more with the kite so these are not wrapping all the way up to the top. And instead, maybe we can see about getting these kind of wrapped a little bit lower than that. So we still have some area on the top and bottom. Let's hide this so we can see. So yeah, just like that. And that way it looks a little bit more like a beach ball. So what we can also do is actually get this wrapped to a certain position, or tr at least try to, with the sizing. And if we match this up close, we might be able to kind of get the rest of this texture using UV coordinates or you know whatever we want to do. Uh, but in this case, let's just call it good right now. Leave it like that. Okay. Zoom in a little bit on this ball. I'm going to change the camera perspective to, let's say, a 100 millimeter focal length. For now, let's also change this to sort of a 1080 by 1080 aspect ratio, which is square. And that way we can kind of center this up on the ball and just focus on that. Okay. So this distance will be able to have a really good view of what this is all looking like and might be able to make this a little bit bigger. So you guys can see that at home. Okay. So I always like to add a little bit of variation on the surface detail because I think with just a little bit of normal mapping or bump mapping, uh, we're going to actually increase the realism by a huge factor on something like this. So um, if you're noticing any gaps that are or edges that are really noticeable in the render here, you're going to want to play with the, um, the shrink wrap and bring the offset down even lower. So as low as you can get it where it's still on top of the ball and not going through is about as low as you want. So lower that down a little bit more. And you can start seeing that, um, that line disappearing and that sort of makes it feel a little bit more like it's one material. But for now, we can play a little bit more with our textures here to create some noise on the surface of this ball. So let's actually play with Musgrave. Yeah, so I'm not sure what the keyboard shortcut is right now for the using the um, Node Wrangler add-on for that, but um, was Control Shift left click, but now it's not wanting to kind of do that. Control T is also not working, which automatically adds your mapping nodes and all that in which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, but let's go ahead and do it the old fashioned way. And that's fine. Okay, so vector into vector, generated into here. Okay. So 
So detail will give you a lot of you know, surface variation in terms of the complexity that you see between the black and white values. But if you're gonna scale this up really, really high, it's just gonna take more computing power to output higher levels of detail. So it's not even really gonna be noticeable. I'd leave this down pretty low if you're gonna scale to a pretty high number here. Uh, and then anything else you wanna do to kind of change the black to white values, you can do by adding in a converter color ramp in the middle. And so right now we're kind of defining the bump on the surface of our, um, our beach ball here. Let's grab all this stuff, move it over a little bit more. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna take the black value and I'm gonna change this to a 0.5, just sort of the middle value for bump. And then anything that's white is gonna be coming off and higher off of that. Uh, so maybe something like that. Turn that up a little bit. We don't wanna go too small because from a distance, you're never gonna be able to see it with all the noise in the render right now. Um, but maybe we can play a little bit with the way this is looking. So right now I'm just trying to make a very clean beach ball, you know, no problems with dirt, grime, all that kind of stuff. We'll do that a little bit later. Uh, but you can determine how much, how many bumps you're getting by playing with the contrast here. So the more you have these apart from each other, the more you're gonna get spread across. And then the more you bring these towards each other, the more the contrast is gonna go up and you're gonna either get more white or more black, depending on which direction you go with these sliders. Okay, so then we wanna do a vector bump, which is gonna give us a normal output. So we'll take the color, put that into the height, take the normal, put that into the normal for our uh, principal BSDF, and then reconnect this to the surface. So now what you're gonna see in the highlights is a very bumpy surface for this red plastic. Uh, and it's only on the red right now, it's on the white. And what you'll want to probably do is take the strength way down to 0.5 so that you're gonna get a very subtle um, bump here. And the best way to tell if this is working is if you're getting a, your highlights, um, edges are kind of getting split up. So this lamp here on the white is a pretty clean, smooth, curved line down the ball, but on the red parts, you can see as the render clears up that we're getting a much more jagged sort of edge there. And at this point, when I'm working on these surface details, we're gonna need to turn up our samples for cycles. So let's jump down to sampling. And then you'll see under render, we have 128. For viewport, we have 32. So let's just bump this up to the default 128 for now. And we'll have to let this clear up a little bit and then you can kind of see a better representation of what's happening with the highlights here. Okay. So I'm lowering the scale here, which is gonna increase the size of the bumps. The more you bring the gray up uh, that's middle gray over to the white, the more you're gonna clear off those bumps and you're gonna have just a very flat, you know, no bump surface. So let's stick with something kind of like that. And then I'm just gonna copy the same setup for the other uh, material here. We'll jump back into our material settings, grab the white ball underneath, paste this in, and then all we have to do is connect the bump to the normal there. 
Okay, so that same bump should be carried across from the red to the white all the way across now, and you'll see that applied everywhere, which is gonna be a little bit more realistic uh, in terms of the way that this is working. Um, okay, so if we rotate around, we wanna zoom in a little closer. Cycles is actually sped up quite a bit in 2.8, so this is gonna look a little better. like this, but you'll also notice as we get into our subdurf settings that under our, our, our view here that we are still getting some of this edge detail coming through and that's because the shrink wrap is coming down on the original ball um, and it's a little too uh, unsubdivided so we need to kind of crank that up a little bit more to get a little bit less squares in the middle of the ball here and you'll see that kind of go away. Okay, so this from this distance, we can see that this is kind of not working. Um, and so we need to play with some of our settings here. So let's turn this back up to 300 and see on the red what this is changing and if it's working. If you guys are seeing uh, any delays tonight on the stream, I apologize for that. Um, I'm not sure why that's happening, but hopefully you guys are not getting too much lag from me. Okay, so this is a little bit more clustered together like that, which is kind of what I want. Might bump up the contrast going the other way to get a bit more of that in there. Yeah, so I like that break up a little bit more on the edges. And then once again, let's play with bringing all of that back over to the other side. So let's copy all of this, jump back to the white section, delete and paste. There we go. Okay, so let's let this clean up a little bit, make sure we're happy with where that's sitting. And then we'll talk about options for moving forward. And we'll save again. Okay. I think that's looking okay. Maybe I'll play a little bit more as we get in here on more streams, but I think for now, for tonight, that's a good place to, to kind of leave this. And let's talk a little bit more about uh, what we can do to animate some of this stuff. So uh, we talked about the stripes how we could kind of play with that. Bear in mind that with 2.8, the goal eventually, as they develop more and more versions and releases, is to get to a point where you can animate almost any attribute in the system. And you can already pretty much do that if you hover over any of these input uh, parameters here and you hit I, uh, you can actually add a keyframe uh, for that change. So anything that's more complicated than that, you're gonna have to get into doing some custom rigging, some drivers, some things like that that are uh, gonna give you more options, but there's a lot of interesting ways to get in here and play with uh, custom animation options. So let us switch back to our view here. Now that we've kind of got this into place, let's back this up. Okay. So let's talk about how we might start to rig this up a little bit. I wasn't gonna get into this tonight, but got about half an hour left and I can just kind of demonstrate a little bit about what you may wanna do uh, to get your, your mind wrapped around how we're gonna go about doing this for your, your animation here. So for the ball, um, with a single object, it's pretty simple. We basically rig this up with some empties. Uh, we could add some bones, play with that, um, but we don't even really need to do that if we wanna just kind of play and animate with this. You could grab the ball and just start uh, keyframing the rotation, location, scale, all of that in terms of the size. Now, with the modifier still turned on, you're gonna be able to just animate the ball and this will shrink wrap the stripes back to the ball uh, pretty accurately. So you'd have to really kind of squash this down a lot to break this. It is possible to do it, um, but even at this distance, you can see that it's pretty well together. If you get too 
squash down, your, your stripes on the sides are going to kind of go through the bowl. Um, but you can compensate for that with rigging. So uh, that's one of the ways you could do it. What I'd recommend doing at first is at least creating something to kind of control the position of the ball uh, in your 3D world. So to do that a little easier, what uh, what you can do is start with an empty that is kind of a ring that goes around the circumference of the ball. And that will give you something simple to grab onto as you're trying to animate. So uh, we want to keep all of these empties kind of in place as they are here uh, because we may want to use them later for rigging, uh, but we definitely still need them as long as we have the modifiers active. And we are going to need to play with how we can add those into um, a custom collection or something like that to keep those organized and out of our way because we don't want to be accidentally rotating these uh, or moving those around because it's going to affect our stripes, as you can see there. Uh, so something we didn't talk about that you just kind of saw is the option, uh, again, to move these empties and it affects the stripe positioning and the shapes. So if you actually want to rotate these uh, around the x-axis, you can play with how they come off the ball, which could be kind of an interesting, funny little way to, um, if he lands harshly and bounces, you can have his stripes kind of temporarily jump off the ball and come back on, which is kind of funny. Um, you could also rotate these around another axis and curve all the stripes. So they're, again, this could be used for a dynamic effect to hints at somebody being a little bit coy or shy or, you know, again, it's all dependent on how you decide to go about doing this and what you want to do. Uh, you don't have to add all of these little flares, but this is exactly the sort of thing Pixar would be looking at doing if they were going to be creating character and they wanted to say, all right, we're going to create a beach ball, but we want it to have no eyes, no mouth, no arms, no legs. We just want it to be able to roll. And the only thing we can control is the colors and the stripe width and all that stuff. And by putting those creative limitations on the character design, you're doing something interesting, something original, something that hasn't been done before, and it gives you a challenge and your audience is going to connect with that because at first they're not really going to understand what's happening uh, in your scenes when you're trying to animate these stripes to tell a story. But pretty quickly they start picking up on behaviors because you start you know, personifying behaviors the same way that a dog would when it smiles at you or something like that. And you just start to pick up on the fact that uh, based on the positions of these stripes and the way that they're moving, it's happy or sad or you know confused or uh, all that sort of stuff. And so that's kind of what we're going to be playing with here. As we get into this. So I'm going to turn off the render now because we're going to get a little slow, make our screen full width here. You'll also notice that uh, if we get in here, uh, actually just did something I didn't want to do. Actually hit everything, weird, okay. Uh, again, with the keyboard shortcuts, you're gonna be noticing there's a lot of changes. And so uh, if you're used to using shift spacebar to open and close windows, that's actually gonna be what starts playing through your timeline. Uh, and so shift spacebar, place the timeline, hit escape to stop and it'll reset you back to the first frame. Control space is what you want now to jump full screen inside of a window. So this is what you would do in any of these panels to go full screen and back. And um, so yeah, keep that in mind. Any of these that are being changed, again, they're gonna be displayed on the right hand side of these menus. So if you look through the menus here, you can start memorizing some of these changes. You'll also notice that some of the keyboard shortcuts, uh, and I may have mentioned this before, have not come over yet. So they may change these. Nothing's finalized yet, but if you want to start getting in here and playing, uh, then definitely do that. You can also search the command and it should show the keyboard shortcuts in here as well. So those would be on the right hand side there. So let's play a little bit more with the way things are organized. Let's try to get in here and see how we want to start rigging this up a little bit. Okay, so I'm used to working in layers, but let's see if we can start playing a little bit with collections tonight. So right clicking on this object will give you a lot of options here for uh, what you can do from the outliner perspective. And then 
as we saw, you can jump in here for the collections and add objects to a collection, just like grouping uh, in the previous version of Blender. Um, should be able to hit some keyboard shortcuts to minimize Shift A is collapse everything in there. What I want to do is start organizing my scene a little bit better. So let's grab our empty here. This is the horizontal wrap. This is the other empty, which is the vertical wrap, which is what I'm going to call that. So let's label that. And I want to add this to Yeah, so control G will actually add this to a collection instead of a group. So I'm going to undo that. Let's add it back to collection. This is a collection one. And that will put that here. Add this to collection one as well. So we've got both of our empties there. So turning off the little camera here will uh, disable that from rendering. So we can test that a little bit right here and see if this is working. Turn off that for collection one there. These should disable them from popping up in the preview here, uh, which the camera icon is only going to control this if you actually do a full render. So if you're preview rendering in your viewport, and you turn this on and off, it's not going to mess with anything. You're still going to see the same thing. It's this button here with the grid, which restricts the viewport visibility. So if you want to actually prevent this from rendering when you hit F12, then you would want to turn off the camera, which is there. So now if you hit F12 and start rendering, the ball is going to be gone. You'll also notice that we need to make sure we have our settings updated for our render preview for the subsurf on the stripes because those are still set at a low setting and that's not what we want. So let's grab our stripes, jump back into subsurf. So set it view to six. So we need to set render to six as well. Now when we hit F12, that should update and be smooth. So the same thing needs to be done for the ball. So let's make sure we grab the sphere. So I'm not really able to grab the sphere right now. I don't know why. OK, there we go. So now let's check the subserve on this, change this to four for the render. That's also gonna update that, so we should be good again. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let's save that. Okay, so all that's been added, the sphere itself needs to be added. So then we've got our stripes. Okay, so we're gonna add those to collection here. So now all of our objects are in one setting right here that you can see. So once again, we can turn all these on and off. We want to disable the ability to select these in the 3D viewport. We can uncheck these little arrows and that will prevent us from accidentally grabbing these. So now I can't even um, move these around or I shouldn't be able to move these around. Um, yeah, that's not supposed to let me uh, grab this, but I guess that's something that hasn't been implemented yet. Um, okay, so what else we have here? What is this empty doing? So 
So we actually have three empties here. Let's take a look at what these are doing. Those are all in the stripes. Looks like the vertical wrap is not attached to anything. Okay, weird. Now I can't select it like I'm not supposed to be able to. It's odd. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a bug, but uh, okay. So, looks like the, yeah, the vertical wrap's not doing anything. So this one is actually the vertical wrap. Okay, so let's add this back to collection one. There we go. All right, so now we can't select these, or at least we shouldn't be able to, but we still can. Very weird. Um, guess by turning those on and off there, that actually enables it so you can't select them anymore. So yeah, it works, but it's kind of buggy. So save again. Okay, so now we have these locked off where we can't select those. I'm gonna put those next to each other or maybe I can't because they're alphabetized. And now what I want to do is hide those. Let's turn those off. Let's take all of our lights here and let's add those to a collection. So I'm not sure if I can do that all at the same time. Looks like I can't. And I'm not sure where the background selection is going, uh, collection, or where it should be showing up in there, but I don't see it. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that's a bug or not, but anyways, doesn't look like that is going to be something we can kind of use. So let's go ahead and get kind of get rid of that. All right, so these lights, let's go ahead and just turn these off. Camera, we'll add to the collection and now we can turn that off. Okay, so we're just loving their ball here. Finally, that took way too long. All right, so let's add in another empty and we're gonna use a circle this time. You'll notice that it puts it vertically. So we're gonna wanna rotate this. Let's try negative 90, which is actually going to give us a 270 degree rotation there. Move that up by one on the Z axis. So it's right in the center of our sphere. And then once again, let's apply the scale. Don't think it'll let us on an empty. So that did not work. Um, but we can make this a little bit bigger like that. And now this is basically what we're going to use to select our ball and kind of move it around on the floor. So let's grab our ball and then we're going to shift right click our empty. I'm going to hit control P and I'm going to choose objects. Okay, so now when I move this around, that's going to follow. Uh, we're also going to want to do the same thing for our, um, our wrap empties here. So let's go ahead and grab the horizontal wrap and the vertical wrap, right click to make the uh, empty active, control P, objects, and keep transform this time. And now everything should move uh, all together. So it should, but it's not. Okay, so let's turn these empties back on and make them selectable. So yeah, they're not parented. So let's grab these again. Object keep transform, control P, object keep transform. 
Okay, so now that's working, but our um, stripes are rotating as we go. It's kind of interesting and weird. So we will have to figure out a way to fix that. Doesn't look like it's happening as we move on the Y axis for the rotation, just the X axis. Interesting. So what we may have to do is, I don't want to apply these uh, modifiers because if we do that for the stripes, then we're going to have a problem uh, when we want to just jump into edit mode and rig this up to deform based on our width. So I don't want to do that. Uh, well, we need to find a way to cancel out the rotation here. So first thing we need to do is pinpoint why when we move this uh, here where it's parented that it's actually rotating uh, these stripes. So to do that, we need to in grab one of these empties and move it to figure out which one of these is doing it and kind of figure that out. So. moving these on each of these axes to determine kind of what's going on here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Get to think our way through this one. So I think it has something to do with it using the local coordinates, so the global coordinates when it's trying to transform, uh, but I'm not sure how to switch that up right now. Definitely know it is the, I think it's the simple deforms that are doing it. So if I were to un, if I were to disable the shrink wrap and move this around, let's see if it still happens. So yeah, it does. So it's not the shrink wrap. Let's see if it's deform two. Looks like it might be deform two. They'll relabel this simple deform horizontal wrap and vertical wrap. And let's turn this off. Yeah. So this is happening because of the horizontal wrap. Not sure if there's a way to fix that using our current setup. So switching the orders around is not really an option. We could try a constraint, but I'm not really sure which one we would have to play with. The way we would do that is to jump into the constraints tab, uh, make sure we have our stripe selected. And then for object constraints, you can pick from a lot of the uh, things here to kind of override certain things um, that are normal behavior. So as far as the transformation goes, may want to play with a way to maybe limit rotation. So I'm not sure which one of these would do it. I'm not, I'm not really sure. It might even be the ball that's causing it to, to do that. Let's 
let's try some other ones. Let's try like maybe a copy rotation. Constraints are not something that I play with a ton. I'll try copy rotation from the empty target here. So let's try location, because location may be actually what's driving this to be a problem. What if I choose limit location, minimum X, maximum X. Weird. Okay, so it may be something we have to do, instead of parenting, we may have to do some constraints instead of uh, just straight up parenting to this empty. So let's uh, hit Alt P, clear the parent, keep the transformation, and we'll do that on both of these. And ball is still moving with that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do instead is let's try a copy location from this empty. We're gonna do an offset. Let's do local to world or world to local. Okay, so maybe that's working. Let's try the same thing here. Pick this empty. Offsets. Let's space a little space. Yeah, this is weird. We're gonna have to play with this a little bit. So maybe next time um, I'm here tomorrow night, I'll play with this a little bit and we'll see what we can do to set this up. Uh, but this is gonna be interesting because uh, yeah, I haven't played with constraints in a while and I think that's what we're gonna have to use to get this set up in a clever way. Because basically what we're gonna wanna do is have the ability to just move this empty around and have the stripes stick to the ball and then we're gonna have a separate empty just for rotating the stripes and rolling it across the ground, right? Uh, we may actually have to do a little bit of scripting to get that set up because that's gonna be a little more complicated. But anyways, hope you guys enjoyed tonight. Um, I am gonna sign off at this point, uh, but I will be back tomorrow night with some awesome stuff. So hope you guys uh, have a good evening. Happy blending, and I'll see you guys tomorrow night, same time, 7 p.m. Central, for some more action with the ball here. Bye, guys.